Hey, e-commerce friend, today's episode is a replay of one of our most popular episodes. And even if you listen to it the first time, I encourage you to listen to it again, because it's likely your business has evolved a lot since then, and there might be something that's more relevant to you right now, or you might just hear it differently. So don't go away, listen through, let's get into it. Welcome to the e-commerce badassery podcast, the place for scrappy female entrepreneurs who want to learn actionable steps and strategies to grow the traffic, sales, and profit in your e-commerce business. I'm your host, Jessica Totillo Coster, a 20-year retail veteran who spent three years as the only employee of a seven-figure online store. That shit was crazy. I know exactly how it feels to do all the things, and I'm sharing everything I learned the hard way so you don't have to. I may have started this business by accident, but supporting badass bosses like you lights me the fuck up, and I am so stoked to see you grow. Are you ready, babe? Let's roll. Welcome back to the e-commerce badassery podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Totillo Coster. If you've been with me for a while, you know I talk a lot about repeat customers because it's easier to convert a repeat customer than it is to get that first sale. But that doesn't mean we can ignore trying to get new customers, right? If you've been wondering how to convert more new customers, then you're going to want to hear from today's guest, Rishi Rawit. He's obsessed with buyer psychology, shopper behavior, and his most prized possession is a Sears catalog from 1897. As founder of Frictionless Commerce, he spent the last 13 years dialing in his technique to get first-time visitors to convert and has narrowed down the three things every entrepreneur should do to maximize their sales. Hi, Rishi. Welcome to the show. Hey, Jessica. Nice to be on the show. And that was a great introduction. Thanks. <laughs> you are very welcome. Before we get into the really good stuff, tell me more about the Sears catalog. Why is it so valuable to you? I can close my eyes and I can go back 200 years and imagine a time where people in small towns in America were receiving a catalog from a company they had never heard of or at least physically seen in Chicago and in that catalog, there were 500 pages, basically full of ads. And they were selling things from corsets to silverware, to books, to Bibles, and everything was hand-drawn. And this is the backdrop in which the copywriter and the series of copywriters at Sears had to work against. And they had to write a story so persuasive that people would be willing to pay in advance because they would have to send the money up front. And then after maybe a week or two, hopefully receive the product and like it. So these copywriters were just incredibly talented. And whenever I feel I'm doing a really good job and I've conquered the mountain of copywriting, I just turn around, walk to my bookshelf, open the catalog, read a couple of ads, and I feel pretty terrible about myself. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Yeah. I never think back that far, but if you do think about it, like they had their work cut out for them. I mean, now with e-commerce, right, we can give the customer almost instant gratification. So it's a little bit easier to convert people, but I can imagine that was a lot more difficult. And we think we had it hard, right? That's right. That's the story <laughs> we tell ourselves. Yeah. First, I'd love you to just name the three things that my audience should be doing every day. And then I want to dig into each of them in a little bit more detail. So what are those three things? I'll start off with the most important, which is their story. They need to embrace, fall in love with, nurture like a loving parent, their story. And they need to be proud of it. And they need to talk about it every single day. And they need to keep on working on it. And they need to keep on practicing telling their story. Because in all of the testing that I've done, and we've run hundreds of experiments, what I find is that experiments where we are emphasizing an aspect of the story or the entire story have the biggest lifts in conversion rates. People, buyers are craving authentic stories. They will not say that in a survey. So if you ask them, no one's going to tell you that, I want to hear more about your story, but it's deeply embedded in our psychology. And therefore, when we see it, we just respond to it. So focus on your story. 
So I definitely want to dig into this. And I actually, in last week's episode, talked about being authentic and telling the story of the why behind what you do. And I think it's something that we all struggle with, myself included, right? Because when it's your own stuff, you feel like you're repeating yourself over and over and over again, right? And you think nobody cares. So do you have any tips, and I'll be listening for myself, is how can we pull our story out and incorporate it into the day-to-day marketing of our business? I totally hear you. I struggle with it myself. It's really easy to kind of tell customers that that's what they need to do, but it's very hard to do it myself. But there is a mental construct that I use that has really helped me get the story out of customers. And so I think your listeners would benefit from this as well. There's going to be a lot of eye closing that happens in this episode, but I want you to close your eyes. Unless you're driving, unless you're driving. Unless you're driving. That is true. No, no, no. That's true. That's true. I want you to think about a scenario where you have had an incredibly busy day. You're at a trade show or you've been talking to suppliers. It's just a work day. You've had a really busy day and It's five o'clock and you really want to treat yourself. You're in downtown of whichever city you live in and you walk into a nice hotel, you go to the bar and it's a really beautiful bar and you're sitting there and you've ordered your favorite cocktail and you're just unwinding. And right next to you is a patron and you guys strike up a conversation. And I mean, oh my God, what are the odds? It turns out that the thing that you've invented, the thing that you are selling online is the exact same thing that this person has been struggling to fixed in their life. It could be sportswear. It could be anything that you're selling. And the point is that while you're having this conversation, the person leans into you with great interest because they've been struggling with this themselves. They've not found a solution for it. They've Googled stuff and they've seen 5,000 ads, but they haven't found the solution for it. And so they ask you, hey, Jessica, here is what I'm struggling with. Can you tell me what makes your product compelling? And the thing you have to think about is, what would you tell these people? And that's the mental construct that I use. And I find when I frame it this way, my clients have this amazing story that they is not available on their website at all, at any page on the website. I think the reality of having a conversation with someone you won't meet again, I think it really just opens you up to kind of really bring out all your excitement about your business, which we tend to temper when we're actually talking to customers face-to-face or when we're talking to people on the web? Oh my God. 100%. I often use myself as an example, right? Because my audience is familiar with my business and what I talk about. And I started talking more about the fact that like, I'm doing this to put more money in the pockets of other female entrepreneurs And I run my business different because I've been shit on by so many other consultants. And that is what is the most important thing to me. And as I talk about that more, and when I say that to them on a sales call, they're like, yeah, that's how I've always felt before. And then they're like immediately connected. So that's the thing that sets me apart. And people really resonate with that. So for all of you guys listening, I know it sometimes feels like your story is insignificant and like it doesn't matter. And it only feels that way because it's your story. But the rest of us want to know more about it. Okay. What's the next one, Rishi? Before I move on to the next one, I'll say one other thing about the story, which is keep on working on your story. And the way to work on it is to keep on asking why. So for example, Jessica, you mentioned that, you know, the reason why you started the business was because you want to help people not get screwed over the way you got screwed over. Why? Why is that? Dig deeper into that. And what's going to happen is just that mental exercise of digging the why all the time, you'll actually get to the root cause of your story. So I want to just end by saying that, you know, don't just think of your story as like, okay, here's my story. My exercise is done. I work on it every day. Every day, ask yourself, why, why, why? And it'll take you to very interesting places. Or some scary places. (laughs) Interesting places. (laughs) That's a very good reframe. Well, yeah, because I think about how I felt after that. And 
you know, you feel taken advantage of and you feel stupid and like, oh, wow, I must not even know what the hell it is that I'm doing. Right. And then you kind of turn that all in back on yourself. So I don't want to go that deep, Rishi, but I will. I will. (laughs) Okay. Number two. Number two actually relates to number one in a very special way. Number two is focus on first time buyers. And I think one of the reasons why people don't focus on their story, which is point number one, is because they say, well, I've already told my story. Well, how are you framing this? Are you talking about you've told your story to people who've bought from you 50 times? You've told your story to your spouse? Those are not the people we're selling to. We are selling to people that are coming to your website, have never heard of you before, ever. And they have no idea where they are. They think they're lost. They're in a dark alley. And they need to hear this comforting voice that tells them they're at the right place, that it's a great coincidence that the thing that they're trying to solve is the thing that you've devoted your entire life to. That is what you need to focus on. You need to focus on those first-time buyers because the statistics are pretty damn scary. 96% of people that are on your website are not going to buy today unless you give them a compelling reason to buy, number one. Number two is that 68% of people that are on your website never going to come back to your website. So you have all of these statistics that are basically saying that this first-time buyer who's come to my website, first of all, they probably won't buy. And number two, if they don't buy and they leave, there is zero chance that I'm ever getting them back again. And that accelerates for me the importance of first-time buyers. And I'll say one other thing about first-time buyers, because I think One of the mistakes that marketers make is that we tend to look at marketing and say, everything is important. And Jessica, you're absolutely right about repeat customers. This is the sad part about being a business owner. Everything is important. But the reason I focus on first-time buyers is because I feel it's not emphasized enough. And so the way I look at it is that don't just invest 10% of your effort on focusing on first-time buyers. Spend an hour every day going to your website. Go into your mobile website, by the way, because most people are on their mobile devices and ask yourself, why should I hang around here longer? If this was not my business, why would I have cared? And that will lead you down interesting insights, things that you should keep in mind. And another thing that I think is really important when it comes to first time buyers is to, I don't make this overcomplicated, but I think in very simple terms, keep your focus on first time buyers because here's the other thing to keep in mind is that all of your other metrics jessica like your upsells cross sells your lifetime value of customer word of mouth marketing these other things that businesses depend on are all based on first time buyers if you can improve your first time buyer conversion rate by 5% everything else improves by 5% too because now you have 5% more people that are doing word of mouth for you so that again brings our attention to the fact that first time buyers are critically important Right. That was one of the notes that I had that I wanted to kind of make sure everyone understood what you were talking about when you said this, because I feel like most people will hear it and think, okay, I just have to focus on getting new customers, right? And then end up ignoring those repeat customers. But it's really a balance. And I actually have a podcast episode where I talk more about this and I don't remember which number it is, but I will put it in the show notes so that you can kind of figure out where you should focus. But I like that we're saying those first time buyers. And so it's like a little bit different than a new customer, right? It's like when they're on your website, how do you get them to actually take the action to buy And to focus on that, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's not necessarily about how do I get more new customers to my website? It's how do I convert them when they get there? And you have to nail that down because like Rishi said, if your website doesn't convert, you can send as much traffic to it as you want and it's going to be money down the toilet and it doesn't matter. And then if you don't get the first time buyer, you sure can't get a repeat one. That's right. And I want to share another statistic to give your audience the motivation to do this, which is that we've been doing this for the last, you know, 11 years. And so we've looked at data for over 150 different online retailers. And what I will tell you from my experience is that around 15% of your audience that are on your website. So what the way we calculate this is we look at 
people that have spent more than four minutes on a website and have seen more than three pages. That to me is a really important proxy for people that we can persuade. Because I think the idea of like, okay, everyone who comes to my website is someone I can convert is ludicrous. So we need to first be practical about it. And the way to be practical is to say, my audience are people that are engaged with my website. And the way to define engagement, I define it as four minutes, but you can define it differently. Four minutes and three pages. So if they've spent four minutes on your website and they've seen three pages, then they are pretty damn engaged. What we find is that on average, around 12 to 15% of people on your website fall in this category. So if your website, for example, is converting at 2%, that really means that 10% of people that are engaged on your website and are looking to solve the problem you're promising to solve are choosing not to buy from you. These are dollars that are leaving your website every single day. And I think that is a very strong negative motivation uh, to understand that all this work you're doing, all this great work you're doing, you know, talking to business owners, spending time on advertising, creating word of mouth marketing is being wasted if we're not actually converting people that are in our conversion zone, in our conversion target. So you're losing 10% of potential sales every single day because you're not doing a good enough job convincing and converting first-time buyers. Nothing like lost money to motivate an entrepreneur (laughs) to work a little harder. Okay, so I know you have one more thing that you wanted to talk about, and then I'd like to kind of weave this all together with some actionable things that they can like go do today. So let's talk about that last thing. So the final item is the most complicated and the most interesting aspect of this entire thing, which is focus on buyer psychology. Let's just think about how businesses are born. Someone has an idea or has experienced a problem and they figure out a solution for it. And then they figure out that there are more people like me that have the same problem. And that's how they start their business. So we assume that everyone that's on our website or everyone who's our customer has not only understood that they have a problem, but has understood that they need a very specific solution for it. And also that that solution pretty much is our website or is what we sell. This is not how shoppers behave at all. You may have spent years kind of thinking about the problem that you're solving, but shoppers may have struggled with it for years, but it's under the surface. And this is the point I want to make is that we assume that people know exactly what they want. People absolutely don't know what they want. And so what happens is that this leads us down two completely different paths. Because we assume shoppers know exactly what they want, we focus on features and benefits. And that is the wrong thing to focus on. The thing to focus on is their subconscious desires, needs, and fantasies, fears, all of those things, because that is what essentially propels us to make progress in our life. There is something at a very fundamental level. Not only are shoppers hiding that. So if you were to survey them, they would never confess to you the emotional drivers for why they're doing what they're doing. But more importantly, this is the more bizarre part, is that shoppers themselves don't know what those emotional drivers are. And there's been tons of research on this. The first piece of research on this was done in the 80s in MIT, where Professor Eric Von Hippel coined a term called unarticulated needs. And his whole point was there is a whole set of consumer needs that we don't even have a language to express. And his analogy was, imagine you're going to a car dealership and they have all these different colors of cars available. How do you express to the salesperson what color you're looking for? And he was describing that as an unarticulate. You know when you see it, but you can't describe it. Your shoppers are experiencing the same anxieties when they're navigating your website as well. Now, buyer psychology by itself is a universe. And I can't expect myself or anyone listening to this podcast to be able to master it. So what we've done is, by the way, I would also confess that I'm the laziest person in the world. So what happened was over the last 11 years of A-B testing, we were basically trying to find techniques of convincing and converting online shoppers, the simplest techniques that we could think of. And so when we started dipping our toes into buyer psychology, we tested all kinds of ideas. And then we zeroed in 
on nine specific aspects of biopsychology and those we found had the highest conversion rates. It's what's really kind of helped us significantly improve conversion rates for clients. So point number one is shoppers are skeptical of too good to be true. And I want to really emphasize this point because this is something that we need to be really aware of. We are trying to make a transaction online with someone who has never heard from us before, has never seen us before. We're asking them to give us their credit card information. And we're then saying, we'll ship something out to you. There is a huge leap of faith here. And so what I recommend clients do is when they are reading their story, when they're reading their sales pitch, pay close attention to things that might seem too good to be true. I'll give you a very simple example. Imagine if I went to one of your listeners and I said, I'm really good at conversion optimization. I can improve your conversion rates by 80%. Chances are really high that they will not hire me, even though 80% is eight times higher than 10%. So if I said I can improve by 10%, there's actually a higher likelihood that they will hire me versus if I said I can improve by 80%. And the reason for that is because 10% seems believable, 80% seems ludicrous. So when you are going through your sales copy, Pay attention to things that you're talking about that skeptical user might look at and say, if you were to say the world's most comfortable sports bra, for example, well, how are you backing it up? Like, how did you come to this? Pay attention to all of those things because all of those things can be deal breakers for shoppers. So anyway, that's number one. Point number two is shoppers find expertise very sexy. We are living in a hyper-specialized world. When people have a medical condition, you don't just go to a general doctor and say, hey, I have this problem. You go to the best specialist you can find that you can afford in your local area. So people are expecting that same kind of expertise online. So the way you need to convince and convert them is by letting them know that you are an expert. So whatever you can do from a copywriting perspective to illustrate that you are an absolute expert at what you do in terms of the way your product is designed, uh, the ingredients, all of those things, focus in on that. Point number three is that we root for people who beat the odds. There is something in the human spirit that we want to work and we want to cheer on people who've overcome difficult moments. And so if there are aspects of your story that show you overcoming something, which by the way, is going to be for all of you, I would focus on talking about it because you'll be amazed at how much it humanizes you to your potential audience. Point number four is that we are fascinated by surprising details. You know so much more about your products and services than anyone else does. Talk about some really interesting stats. You can do a Google search and you'll find lots of interesting articles. Pull up those numbers and include them in your sales copy. So if you're making an exfoliating oil or if you're making a room air purifier, pull up some stats about allergens or skin cells, something surprising. And you'll be amazed at how much more interesting it makes your story. Point number five is that we are visual animals. So if you can visualize anything that you're saying through a graphic or some kind of visual mechanism, do that. We need motivation to break habits. This is a really important point. We assume that our competitors, our other companies, actually our biggest competition is old habits. So the consumer knows that I don't have to change my habits. So we have to give them the motivation to break that habit. Point number seven is we love personalized experiences. So anytime you have a chance to personalize an experience with someone, do it. It could be a simple personalization or it could be complicated, but you want the reader to feel like, hey, did someone just hack my brain and read my brain? Because I was thinking these exact same thoughts. Point number eight is that we like knowing that we've stumbled on something rare. We all like unique experiences. You know, when you discover music, we all like discovering music that our friends don't know about. So that aspect of serendipity is really important as well. So how do we communicate this to someone who is on our website? And then the final point is we must resolve all negative thoughts before a sale can ever actually take place. If there is even one lingering negative thought floating in the mind of the shopper, you know what they'll do? They'll defer judgment. What they'll say is that, you know what? I don't have all the information I need to make the purchase today. I think I want to make it next week. I don't want to stress myself. Next week is their way of saying, I'm never, ever going to come back to your website. So we're on video, right? Because it's better to have a conversation that way. You can't see it. But I feel like the whole time I was just like mouth open, soaking in every word, because these are all things that I think when you sit and think about it and you hear someone else say it, you're like, 
oh yeah, duh, like totally get it. And intellectually, I think we know these things, but we get in our own way and we don't sit down and do the work. I think we're all guilty of this. We get so caught up in just like keeping the lights on. So aside from saying like, just do it, do you have any tricks for us on how we can actually like implement this or where we should start? I would say there are two things. Number one is that when it comes to the biopsychology part, again, think of yourself sitting on the other side of the screen. Don't think of yourself as a seller. Think of yourself as a buyer and just think about how a buyer would feel. And if it's hard for you to think about buyer psychology, I mean, I've devoted my entire life into understanding buyer psychology. So I can understand that you, your readers and your audience might not want to spend the next 11 years trying to figure out their audience. What I would say in that case is very simply, start emailing your we call these new buyers. When someone buys from you for the first time, this is a very important physiological event that has taken place in their life. They have gone from non-consumption to consumption. They have decided to change something in their life by buying your product. This is a pretty big change for them. Even if what you're selling for $20, it's a big emotional hurdle to buy something for the very first time. You know, today I was talking to my wife about hemp seeds and we've been using a certain brand of hemp seeds. And now we're going to be changing brands to another brand and they're very inexpensive. But I was like, are we sure about this? You know, I mean, should we do this? There is something about, you know, switch behavior is very complicated. So what I would say is that whether you have one person that is buying from you for the very first time every month or 50 people, it doesn't matter. And if you don't have time for it, identify two people every month that have bought from you and send them an email directly as the CEO and just start having conversations with them. And don't use automation, send them an actual email and say, Hey, James, Hey, Jessica, you bought my product and just ask them questions. And you know, one of the questions we like to ask is a very interesting question, which is what was happening in your life at that point that caused you to buy this product and put them in that mental framework, because by understanding what's happening in their life, you can then apply that because there'll be other people that are in that same state of mind. So literally like getting them to talk about those things will give you amazing insights into biopsychology. The other thing I would say is that you can, I mean, I don't want to plug myself, but you can subscribe to my newsletter. I talk about biopsychology every week. And so that would be another way to do it. But I would say, if you want to keep things simple, just start thinking about the experience from the buyer's perspective, and then start talking to people that are actually buying your product. I love that. And we'll have the link to join um, Rishi's newsletter in the show notes as well. And I'm going to have him tell you all the places you can find him. But I do also recommend that you find him on LinkedIn because he's like the king of like the one liner on his LinkedIn post and everything he posts, you're just like, oh, how did you get that into one sentence? But it has so much power in it. Okay. I do have a couple of questions that I like to ask all of my guests. And my big thing is keeping it real with the audience, right? I think there's a lot of people on the internet that are like, Hey, put up an e-com site, spend some money on ads. And tomorrow you're going to be a millionaire. And it just doesn't work like that. So I would love to know in all of your years of like testing and working with clients, something you did or tried that like, just did not work. Coming from a world of A-B testing, I can tell you for a fact that almost most things that I work on don't work out. I think it's very easy to talk about something that didn't work out that you overcame later on, because that's a kind of a fancy way of saying I made it work out. I want to talk about something that didn't work out and I still haven't figured out how to make it work out. I love that. Which is how to actually effectively monetize Facebook advertising for my customers. Now, this is not an area that I'm involved in personally, but because we do conversion optimization, oftentimes clients will say, hey, you apply all this buyer psychology copy on the website, can that same magic be applied on our advertising side of the equation? Now with PPC, we've been very successful, but with Facebook advertising, I've tried it with two large clients, completely different industries, and we have just simply not been able to make it work out for us. We work with technical teams that are very good at targeting. So I'm not involved in that part, but I'm focused on writing persuasive copy to get people to click on our ads and then come to a landing page and convert. And I have never been able to make it work. So that's a massive failure that I am confronted with on a regular basis. 
Thank you so much for sharing that because here's a guy for you listeners, right? He's been doing this a long time. He's found a lot of success for a lot of clients. And here's this thing that on paper sounds like he should be able to get right and he can't. So for those of you who are running your own ads and maybe not getting the results that you want, or you're trying to write your own copy and you're kind of beating yourself up saying like, well, I should be able to do this. Well, maybe not. Maybe you just need a little help. Like you're not always going to get it right. So thank you for sharing that because as entrepreneurs, we're trying to do all the things, especially when we're starting out and haven't hired a team yet. Even when we do have a team, right? We're still the CEO. And I think we beat ourselves up a lot. So I appreciate you sharing that. On a more positive note, what about something you've done that just like the results just sort of blew you away? I have a story to share here as well. And it actually ties into one of the tactics that we talked about. It was surprising to me that it did so well. So we were working with a client that sells a highly technical product. It costs 900 bucks. It has lots of bells and whistles. It's not an impulse buy. And when we were doing user research, we were trying to understand the product and we're not buyers of the product. And I was like, this is so complicated. There's so many technical details, room, air, density, all of these technical jargon terms that I don't even understand. And I, again, I went back to my tactics and I said, okay, let's focus on one of our tactics, which is people like personalized experiences. And I was thinking when you say personalization, it means personalized for the user type. So if I am someone who needs to buy the product, but I don't have 10 minutes to read the story or the description versus someone else who is a methodical shopper who reads all the reviews, all the details, wants to know all the technical details how do we differentiate between these two groups? And what happens is oftentimes when marketers understand that are told that they are having to write copy for multiple audiences, we by default start writing copy in a way that appeals to everyone, which is basically code for saying it appeals to no one. And it creates super long pages that have no meaning, don't stand for anything very specific because they're dealing with so many different audience types. And we kind of were debating the same thing ourselves. And we said, hey, we have a tactic, let's just use it. So what we did was on the product page, right where we show the description, we hit the description by default and we added two buttons. And we simply said, how much time do you have today? And there were two buttons. One said two minutes and the other one said, I have time. And the idea was that let the user raise their hand up and say who they are, what their mental state is and what they're ready for. And if someone did, I have two minutes, we gave them the elevator pitch of this incredibly technical product. Now the client was freaking out because he was like, there is no way that someone who is going to be on this page for two minutes is uh, two minutes. It's not enough time. And then if someone said, I have time, we showed them the long form copy that we've been working on. We thought that this would be a little better than the page that the client had, but we actually registered a 30% improvement in sales for that product. So the client was blown away by it. And so I like to share it because I didn't expect it to be so good. Do you remember which one got clicked on more? We did not actually set tracking for clicks to those buttons. We basically had two versions of the page. One version had just shown the long form copy and then the other version broke it up into the short form and long form. Got it. Just curious because I think I'm the 10 minute shopper, right? Like I'm going to read all the things. I don't know why I do that. But then at the same time, I will buy things on impulse always. Usually clothes and shoes, I buy on impulse. <laughs> but that's just me. <laughs> oh my gosh, this has been so amazing. I hope you guys are all taking notes. I want the focus for you guys to actually sign up for Rishi's List. But I am going to put those points in the show notes. So if you didn't take notes, they'll be there for you to copy and paste. You know that I always want to get you all the information and you can get all of those at ecommercebadassery.com forward slash 26 and they'll be there for you. Is there anything else, Rishi, that you want to share? Like if they take away anything from today's episode... What is the most important thing? Well, actually, I'm going to give you a controversial answer that does not relate to anything that I've said. This is what I want you guys to take away. Take away this idea that every single morning when you wake up, it's a brand new day. 
it's a new opportunity for you to work on your business. And I think that everything we've talked about will make sense if you start looking at your world from that perspective, because I think we tend to cram so much into our days. And so someone might read this and might instantly say, I'm going to apply these nine copy buyer psychology techniques to my website, and they'll go crazy for the first two, three days, they'll get totally burned out and then they'll never use it again. A much better approach is to every morning reset your day and recognize that days end and new days begin and you have a new opportunity to refocus your energy. So forget about everything that I've said. All of the things that I've said play secondary role to the principle of being forgiving to yourself starting your day with a fresh slate and then conquering the world every single day and then recognizing that we're going to fall off and make mistakes and be set back on a regular basis. And that's okay too. Thank you for that permission. (laughs) I think I may have needed to hear that just as much, if not more than my audience. So, so amazing. Please tell everyone where they can find you and where you hang out the most. You're right about LinkedIn. I spend inordinate amount of time on LinkedIn. Every time I have an idea and all of my ideas are based on buyer psychology or copywriting, I will share it on LinkedIn. Some of my ideas are so raw that I feel bad about sharing them so early, but I find that that principle of just sharing stuff, you know, I'm constantly looking at websites. I'm constantly on my phone, looking at websites, studying on behalf of my clients And I'm amazed at the kind of marketing innovation that's happening in the world around us. And so no one person can keep track of it. So when I find it, instead of like cataloging it just for myself, I take a screenshot of it. I put a quick note and I post it on LinkedIn. And, you know, even if 5% of my audience looks at it and says, this is exactly what my client was looking for, that is a good enough goal for me. So LinkedIn is the place that I can be found. If you just look for me, my name is Rishi Rawat. Jessica's notes will have my spelling. I don't expect you to know my spelling. You will find my profile. And then the other place that I think is a really good place for us to hang out is my weekly newsletter, where every Monday morning, I talk about one aspect of buyer psychology. It's all related to the topics that we had on this call today. The difference is it's much more specific. Like, for example, we talked about the nine buyer psychology elements. I'll just pick one sub element and show one example to illustrate and drive home that principle. And those ideas I share on my Monday newsletter and I share just one idea. So it's not overwhelming. It takes less than two minutes to read it. And then it just inspires you to kind of conquer the world for the rest of the week. So that also is a great way to sign up. And the way to do that is visit my website, frictionless-commerce.com forward slash join. And that'll kind of take you to the sign up page. But if you just go to frictionless-commerce.com as well, you'll be able to kind of see what I'm up to. And there's a sign up there as well. Got it. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that we were introduced by Josh. So if you're listening, thank you. This has been amazing. I hope everyone is really taking what Rishi is saying to heart, like I already mentioned. And hey, I'm guilty of this too, guys. So he's talking to me just as much as he's talking to you. And myself. Yeah, (laughs) right. We're all a work in progress. And I really, really, really love the just every day is a new day to focus on your business. So Thank you again so much. Thank you to the audience for hanging out. I appreciate all of you and I will see you on the flip side. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you like what you heard, I'd be so grateful if you'd leave a review on Apple Podcasts and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you're looking to surround yourself with more product entrepreneurs who totally get your life right now, get your booty on over to the e-commerce badassery Facebook group. Can't wait to see you there. Until next time, e-commerce friends, stay badass.